Okay, Kay. they need to not come over here. Like, know, don't tell stories to each other. Hey, balls away! Balls away! You guys suck volleyball, balls away! Where's it that? Literally anything else. Live. Okay, we're good. Okay, so we're running? Yeah. So, link, share, copy. Faculty. And I am going to let, um, I'm going to let Miss Ellis send it out on Facebook and stuff. Cool. Here, just copy. Mm -hmm. Just copy. It'll be posted. Copy that? Like, the whole thing. Not go to Facebook and just post it there. Oh, on the Mazer groups. Mazer. Um, Roll just, up. Ooh, it's under my. There we go. And then just post. Just. Cool. Okay, I'm going to grab my phone and double check. Yet. But like I can hear. Do you need headphones? Because this mic's working great. I think it's it might be picking up from this mic, but it's picking up just as well as that one would be. So I think we might just be fine. Is there a way to trade it in case this starts ringing? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. That's only a headphone jack? It's not an input jack. Do you have one of those adapters that has an input jack? To a USB. Yeah. Let me see if I have one. That's why it was picking up the snaps, because it's not coming through this. I thought, like, because the one on my laptop is a more standard headphone. Because, yeah, that's only headphones.
Hi, everybody. I just muted it like hey. a second ago. It was on for a little while, and then I realized it was on, and I muted it. If we're magically not muted on YouTube, hi everybody. Hope you're doing fine. after the last lecture? Yes.
pull it. Yeah. Can I? Okay, uh, middle schoolers, you guys get these chairs right here. So go ahead and come up and take a seat in the chairs. Okay. If you see a high schooler in a chair, very kindly have them move. Okay. So middle schoolers, go ahead and take a seat in the chairs. Stick your backpack in front or behind it so you're not fiddling with it. And, and then seniors, seniors, you guys can have your typical spot. Okay, seniors, you guys get your uh, traditional spot there in the corner of the bleachers. Yeah, middle schoolers, go ahead and make sure you have your masks, masks on. Okay.
here we are, first assembly, first and only and last assembly of the year. Okay. The seventh graders who had PE, you guys lucked out. You actually get to be here in the assembly listening to last lecture. So we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Cooper, who is going to kind of run everything from here on out. Cooper, just check with Corbin to make sure that we're up and running before you actually like start. Oh, we are, okay. Okay, welcome out everyone. We're so excited for this assembly. Um, I've heard some of the speeches personally and they are amazing, so we are so excited to hear from them. Um, we'd like to welcome out every, uh, today's judges. Um, the teacher's judges for today are Mr. Simmons, Miss Ellis, Mr. Norris, and Miss Moser. Thanks for being here. And then our juniors, um, student judges, are Dallin Butler and Kelsey Ortega. And then we also want to welcome back former alumni last lecture finalists, uh, Kaylin Lee and Clark Bailey. Okay, the winner of today's contest will receive $100 cash, second place winner will receive $50 cash, and third place will receive a $25 gift card. Um, we, always let, we always start off with a sacrificial poet to warm up the crowd. Um, one senior will be called from the audience to read their essay, but will not be part of the competition. This year's sacrificial poet is... Logan Dunyon. Also, seniors, when you come up, if you come up to read, make sure you take off your mask so everyone can hear you. Okay, um, I'm Logan Dunyon, and my last lecture is called Miasma and Memories of Mazer. May 11th at 11.02 p.m., I had a revelation about what to write. Steaming water pouring over my face, I was enjoying my midnight meditations with some exfoliation charcoal by Old Spice. Then, I thought about something that ruined my tranquil waterfall escape. What startled me was you. Not just you, but the fact that you students at Mazer stink. That's right. You smell bad. So, to wash out that nasty miasma of your stench, um, I leave you one simple piece of advice. WEAR DEODORANT! I know you think it's not all that important, and Gerber will tell you repeatedly to wear it, but trust me when I say you don't know how noticeable it is when you don't practice this one simple hygienic habit. Let me share with you how I learned about deodorant at Mazer. In seventh grade, I didn't know what deodorant was. There were a lot of unknowns for me coming to a new school, and I was scared. No, I was petrified. I had stepped out of my comfort zone, and on top of that, puberty was beginning to enter the picture. What I experienced was tough, depressing, and lonely. It wasn't until Boston Sharp started a conversation with me in Latin that I realized I was at a good school surrounded by opportunities to make lasting friendships. I still remember the time he taught me how to apply deodorant. One, two, three, on each side. <laughs> My odors were no more, changed into a subtle characteristic smell of tonic and something fresh. Eighth grade, I learned that too much deodorant can become intoxicating. By lathering too much on, it left a ripe scent that forever lingers in middle school Maine and in the boys' locker room. If only to make things worse, using perfumes and colognes is in no way appealing. Don't try to mask your stench with too many fake fragrances. At one point, I got lavender deodorant because a peer told me that women enjoy when a man smells flowery, and smelling like a fresh field of violet flowers was definitely noticeable. <laughs> Reminded of the deodorant's potent impression, I began to do things that would leave a lasting scent. From when I held hands with Robbie Menson for five minutes in Arches National Park for a photo, to choking on Dr. Pepper while Georgia and I laughed maniacally after making eye contact, 
And from singing Canaan Days with Christian Keller in a bathrobe to stargazing with McKenna Smelter against the soft grass, I began to find purpose in making connections and taking action to preserve them. After this initial experience with finding the right deodorant, I discovered the best fragrance for me, Volcano with Charcoal by Old Spice. <laughs> Not only did the nose know that this was a good scent, but the earthy undertones matched my natural aroma and this blend left behind something subtle and inviting. I finally felt confident with who I was and my deodorant reflected that. I felt comfortable showing my intellectual vulnerability in a Socratic discussion, or showcasing my pride in the Shakespeare competition, or accepting that I was important to friends and family. But there's more to my message than applying the correct amount of deodorant. It is about using your sense of smell. The nose is an amazing tool, often disregarded as a lesser sense, yet we use it all the time. Think about it. When you go to senior prom with your best friend, you remember her sweet fragrance of perfume and the complimentary corsage you made for her. When you perform the WAP dance at a private homecoming, you remember the scent of warm food and friendship. <sighs> when you smell the crisp classical text in Mazur's classrooms, you're reminded of Mr. Simmons' love of the Iliad, or Mrs. Cannon's obsession with chocolate cake, or Myth Smith's attraction to Satan. <laughs> when you're in a cozy cabin during winter, you recollect the clashing aromas of 20 different body washes and deodorants. All of these scents are connected to memories of a fragment of your life that changes who you are forever. We just emerged from a pandemic that nullified smell. Only when affected you noticed its importance. The regularity in which we use our smell is vital to how we experience the world, so make a difference by remembering to smell good. Take your disgusting selves and use the incredible gifts of deodorant and proper hygiene to transform life's tang into potpourri of memorable colognes and lingering perfumes. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Okay, let's start on our finalists. So, the first person that will be giving their speech is Solon Grover. My name is Solon Grover, and my uh, essay is titled The Cold Dive. Though it happened just over a year ago, it seems like forever since I was on the 2020 agricultural winter home trip. So much has happened, and it feels like the many tourist activities we had the privilege of participating in would be impossible in today's plague culture. We were able to gather in large groups, and heaven forbid, we even traveled in cars together. The world was different then, and wholly untainted by bat diseases. Most of the trip occurred in the El Central, El, El Central area of Southern California, but we did get to visit uh, the San Diego Zoo, and afterwards we stopped by the beach for an hour or so. Now remember, this is a California beach and it's January, so going to one is probably something a local would view as typical stupid tourist behavior. The weather itself wasn't that bad, and it was probably in the mid-60s Fahrenheit, which was certainly an improvement from Utah weather, but the water was more relatable to Dante's Ninth Circle than any previously experienced earthly situation. A dip into that water causes a frozen paralysis and a desire for swift death as an end to the pain. After a minute or so of standing on the sandy shore, a small group suddenly decided to engage in an act of masochism and rush into the salty brine. <laughs> so this charge was led by none other than Ms. Yur, who is, happens to be in the audience, thank you. Um, yeah, and she's known for her mottos such as, just do it, face the music, and the water is fine, you're just a weakling. If I had a window, these would be prime grants for defenestration, so yeah. It seemed impossible to me, as I stood with the water just barely reaching my ankles, so that, other, that others could be so far in and seemingly unaffected by the cold. In reality, this was only true because they were incapable of feeling how cold it really was. Their nerves had been numb. They had achieved a new normal. Eventually, I began to move into depths greater than just the height of my feet, and then I began to realize what they were thinking. After getting wet, there's really no point in turning back. The worst is over, at least for the portion of your body that actually did get wet, and returning to dry land would only bring enough warmth to feel just how cold you really were. And thus, I continued until I reached the others and was delivered into the strangely warm hands of hypothermia. It turns out that jumping with the others as the waves came rolling in was pretty fun, and it made no difference when the clouds arrived and covered the whole coast in shade. 
Even after getting so far out, Satan's icy liquid hadn't yet touched my face. The last remaining symbol of my procrastination and uncommitted attitude towards the activity. I knew what I had to do, and after a few seconds of mental preparation, I plunged my head into the water, completing my initiation. I was now ready to play without risk and completely prepared to face the waves with no fear. Just like Californian ocean water, the whole academic experience here at Mazer, I believe, is best approached in a sudden dive. A dip in the water or an easy schedule is often comparable to a limbo where there's just enough to complain about, but too little to grow and become numb to the tougher aspects of the journey. The best thing a student can do, the, can do for themselves is to stretch their capacity for long study and effort by taking on new and challenging classes. For this coming school year, all students, especially we seniors coming upon our new college study, should stay diligent to the theory of progressive overload as we select our courses and work to become stronger people. Thank you. Thank you, Solon. Okay, let me pull out our next speaker. Okay, the next essay that will be read will be done by Gracie Gigi. Hi, I'm Gracie Gigi, and mine is called A Dumpster Bonfire. I am one of the lowest scoring calculus students Mr. Watabe has ever had. I didn't pass any of the assignments. He even stopped roasting me, it was that bad. Every single day, I would walk out of third period BC calculus crestfallen only to return an hour later for my daily lunch date with Mr. Watabe. He drank his Capri Sun while I ate my quesadillas. He taught me all he could, but I wasn't progressing. Every night, I studied series and summations until it was too dark to see my minuscule writing on the pages. I rewatched every video he posted, did the homework sheets twice, and tried to apply math to everyday life in hopes that something would solidify. I was hoping for a 4.0 my senior year, but calculus ruined that goal. I rode on a low C minus every term. Calculus was not going according to plan. In fact, it was a dumpster fire. And yet, it didn't ruin me. I wasn't improving my grade, so in addition to my study dates with my TI-84 calculator, I put energy into making my environment one that invited success. Calculus became one of my favorite classes, but it wasn't integration by parts that brought joy. It was Logan Dunyon's extensive color-coded notes. It wasn't Riemann sums that filled my bucket. It was Josh Beckham claiming he had perfect attendance when he only showed up once a week. <laughs> it wasn't tangent lines that made me laugh. It was the constant banter between Mr. Watabe and Cheyenne Davis. I turned my dumpster fire into a dumpster bonfire. Instead of a disaster, it became a celebration. My grades were burning, but instead of getting frustrated, I roasted marshmallows in the flames of my failure. The first book we read in Socratic 12 was Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. In it, the author says, you see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different from any other. In a car, you're always in a compartment. And because, you, because you're used to it, you don't realize that through the car window, everything you see is just more TV. You're a passive observer, and it is all moving by you boringly in a frame. I didn't want to be a passive observer of my dumpster fires. I wanted to be an active celebrator. My supposed defeats could be turned into blaring victories if I created the right environment. Throughout all my life, I had let my problems act on me instead of acting on my problems, and once I recognized that flaw, I strived to turn all dumpster fires into bonfires. Senior year, I decided to TA 8th period biology in hopes of having time to do my homework. That idea quickly became a dumpster fire. I hardly got one chapter of Socratic reading done because of those crackhead freshmen. <laughs> but I let it go and laughed with them. Not about the skeletal system or the process of osmosis, but at Mr. Kreitzer's dad jokes and Octavia Mosier's love of taking out the recycling bin. Rather than complain that print comp took up so much of my time and energy, I started to appreciate those memories from the long days and late nights. By the end, it wasn't the yearbook I stayed for. It was roasting, roasting Rachel Gunderson after her skiing accident so she would laugh instead of cry. And it was asking Alexander Cannon about his new assignment only for him to show me beautiful designs and stellar photos he whipped up in his sleep. Senior year became the best year of my high school career, regardless of the never-ending dumpster fires. Almost everything was taken away from the class of 2021.
but instead of wallowing in our senior year, we celebrated what we had. We didn't have dances, so we turned senior nights for sports into a themed event, luau's and cowboys twice. We turned the few opportunities we had into amazing memories. We could have stayed home and lamented our dumpster fire of schoolwork and isolation, but instead we threw on a few more matches, grabbed our cowboy boots, and celebrated our senior year dumpster bonfire. The only thing standing between you and a good day is the way you approach it. Surround yourself with supportive people and brace yourself for everything to go wrong, because not everything goes according to plan, and that's okay. Turn your bads into goods, downs into ups, sads into betters, and fires into bonfires. Thank you, Gracie. The next person we'll be hearing from is Rachel York. I'm Rachel York and this is I Choose to be Spider-Man. I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news. I was in the 10th grade Socratic room, the third seat from the door. Miss Smith was gone, so we had a substitute, and I heard someone say, Stanley is dead. Stanley? Stanley who? Stan Lee is dead. I was shocked. I didn't know him, I didn't read Marvel comics, and I had seen very few Marvel movies. But Stan Lee's death made me realize something. Spider-Man isn't real. It seems like something I should have known by the time I was 15. But I'm, and I'm sure deep inside me I did know. But I didn't want to accept that in a multiverse where there is room for an infinite number of spider-themed superheroes, I live in a universe where they're fake. Let me retell to you the origin story of the original Spider-Man. Peter Parker was an ugly nerd. He was bitten by a radioactive spider and gained the agility and proportionate strength of an arachnid. He was also able to build himself web shooters using his aforementioned background as a science nerd. When Peter failed to save his Uncle Ben, he learned that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Thereafter, Peter donned the name Spider-Man and the classic suit and chose to fight crime, a pretty hardcore origin story. He and I are not so different. Though the, the resemblance isn't super clear at first. I'm not exceptionally smart, I don't have spider powers, and I don't have a tragic backstory. I'm just a kid. There it is. I'm just a kid. Peter Parker started life the way most of us do, without great wealth, powers, or popularity. In fact, there, were very, there weren't very many people who even liked him. He was bullied. He didn't have a lifetime full of experience to help him when he was bit by that spider, but like us, when his life was changed by something out of his control, he had to choose what he was going to do about it. You've heard the saying, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Well, greatness isn't the only thing that can be thrust upon you. As your life continues, trials seem to come out of nowhere, thrown at you like a punch from your arch enemy. When Doc Ock comes, are you going to leave your future in his six hands? When Venom tries to take over, will you let him? When the Green Goblin joins the fight, will you watch him destroy you? You're the one who needs to make the choice to fight back. It's not always going to end in victory. Sometimes you need to let it end with a to be continued. But what's important is that no matter how many times you get hit, you find a way to get back up. Peter Parker didn't choose to be bitten by that spider, but he did choose what he was going to do with his powers. I didn't choose to be born into a universe where Spider-Man was make-believe, so let's do this one last time. My name is Rachel York. I wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider and I don't have powers, but I fight my villains and I always get back up because I choose to be Spider-Man. <laughs> nice job, Rachel. always this awkward moment where I like pull. Okay, the next person that will be reading theirs is Marin Golage. I 
Identity Crisis. Marin Elena Gullage, track and field, NHS, AP art, rock climber, gymnastics coach. That's what you'll hear when my name is called at graduation. If you don't know me, now you do, I guess. I wanted to put gymnast on the list, but it didn't make the cut because technically, I'm not a gymnast anymore. I started gymnastics at our city rec center when I was four years old, and before I knew it, once a week lessons turned into four hour practices Monday through Friday. I loved the sound of medals clinking as they bounced off my sparkly Leo when I walked out of a competition. I loved it even when I walked out with tear stained cheeks and taped up ankles. I loved the fun games my coaches had us play and the dumb dances we made up during practice. I loved it even when the AC broke in the middle of summer and we still had to do conditioning. I loved sharing nicknames and tackling my teammates with hugs and high fives after they got a personal best. I loved it even when I chose to say goodbye to them. As sophomore year came around, the head coach had a conversation with my mom and said, I'm going to say that college gymnastics just isn't in the cards for her. This hurt more than a slap in the face. Collegiate gymnastics has been my goal for as long as the signed posters of BYU's 2012 team were up on my ceiling. Even though these dream crushing words gave me the perfect topic to write my best scar essay about, it left me questioning everything. When my dad introduces our family, he always says, starting with Jordan, not Megan. This is my dancer, then I have my two gymnasts, my artist, a singer, and a crazy toddler. So when I stopped doing gymnastics, I remember asking, what am I now, dad? This is when I went through a midlife identity crisis as a 15 year old. The hardest choice I've ever had to make was to retire from gymnastics after 12 dedicated years of it being the most important part of my life. Until that point, being a gymnast was my entire identity. But I want you all to know, I didn't quit just because someone told me I'm not good enough. I retired from gymnastics because after countless pro con lists and prayers, I decided there was more to high school that I wanted to experience. I wanted to take a class for fun, not just because I needed it to graduate. I wanted one of those fancy pins you put on your blazer that gives you the power to decide what theme homecoming decorations will be. I wanted to wear one of those very flattering Mazer Sports uniforms and have my UHSSA stats come up when you Google my name. But what I really wanted was to be more than just a gymnast. That's when I began to realize it's not the things we do that define us, it's who we are. But what we do can help shape us into who we are. Being a gymnast isn't my identity, but doing gymnastics did help make me who I am. My dad wasn't wrong when he introduced me as a gymnast, but he also didn't give the complete picture. He put me under a label, boiling me down to the bullet points of what I do for the sake of keeping an introduction short. So while I have your attention, let's try this again. Marin Elena Gullage, willing to give it my all when I, even when I know I won't win. In my happy place when things are organized. Too scared to eat pancakes or talk to anyone on seventh grade day. Can't get me to be quiet around friends and can eat more than you think. Cries when Miss Frampton gives five sticks of credit and other poetry assignment. Can't live a day without chapstick. Uncomfortable around animals especially when the middle schoolers act like them. <laughs> Convinced my mood is directly correlated to whether or not the sun is out. Senior in the class of 2021, even if Mr. Otabe never remembers I am. Not just a gymnast. Thank you. Good job, Mary. The next person, okay, the next person that will be reading their essay is Tanner Heaton. Forty-two, the number printed on my back every basketball and frisbee game my senior year. It's also the answer to life, the universe, and everything, according to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Let me explain. There's a planet whose inhabitants are so advanced and intelligent, 
they created the ultimate computer, able to answer any question. So they asked, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? To these massive questions, the computer responded it would need a couple million years to answer. So they waited. Generation after generation passed until the computer finally calculated the answer. The answer was 42. Obviously, nobody understood the answer. You see, when answers are given to us externally, we don't always do the work or discovery to understand them internally. I initially approached my classes thinking only about answers and what methods I could use to receive the right ones. I used Google for my assignments and understood as much as the inhabitants did their machine. Answers I didn't understand, ones just to get the grade. I did minimal work, went to school for my daily dose of answers, every day the same routine. I've changed, not because I give better answers, but rather because I have more questions. Beginning sophomore year, I sat in the back of my Socratic 10 classroom, disinterested. After the first hour, I had what I needed. Next period, having Ms. Smith constantly urge me to participate in Socratic discussions was exhausting. Didn't she get it? I knew the book and the historical facts. One day, I determined to end it, to prove there wasn't a need for a dis Socratic discussion. I was winning, or so I thought. I was so confident that I actually shared with the class for once. I wanted to prove the questions Miss Smith was asking were obvious. Why didn't other students see that? But the discussion became an awkward verbal volleyball game. I had the answers, and when others questioned them, I justified, using whatever methods I could. Why was I the only one who understood? Or was I? I took a major step back to self-reflect. I couldn't tell Ms. Smith how useless the discussion was because it wasn't. It was useful. How could this happen? I was right, wasn't I? I thought about it more and more as the day went on. What happened that day was a personal birth of questioning and one massive hit to my ego. I found that every answer in my life had another question behind it. If there are no questions about our societal governments, religions, and institutions, wouldn't everyone be blindly supporting them? That class had me wondering if this was the same situation, and if so, did I really understand what I believe? My Mazer education wasn't about learning society's answers, but understanding society's questions. The questions we find on homework train us to look at society's questions. Understanding the questions that are given on tests is arguably the most important part of doing well on them. Classes I came to appreciate the most were ones that left me with more questions than answers. Specifically, how is this applicable to everyday life? Why was this course important to take? Why have these concepts shifted the world? Every answer gave me more questions to explore. This was my true education personal exploration and discovery. When you truly wonder how to solve 94 equals 2x plus 10 in the classroom, then you can truly wonder how to solve world hunger outside the classroom. That's the Mazer way of learning. This all leads to the big question. What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Why should these questions be asked personally? I found the essence of a question isn't about closing something, but about opening something, discovery. The inhabitants from our story opened their Hamlet book and skipped to the end, trying to disclose their curiosities about it and move on. During my early years at Mazer, I asked far too many questions that dealt with grades, tests, and basic answers, one of my biggest regrets. But I learned how to ask questions that opened up new possibilities, discoveries, and more questions. Not just any questions, but the kind that led me toward understanding myself and the world. The answer isn't 42, but you're going to have to figure that out for yourself.
Okay. Our sixth speech that's going to be read is going to be read by Susie Lane. Uh, my name is Susie Lane, and this is Martinez Onions. If there was a competition for moose lovers, my mother would take the cake. She wakes me up before dawn to see the sunrise, makes her own teas and wildflower syrups, and binges period dramas for 12 hours without batting an eye. She immigrated to America after high school and has taught herself five languages on her own. Mama taught me how to butcher a pig, throw grenades, and identify which mushrooms were poisonous or not. She taught me to chop firewood, find cheap airline tickets, and most importantly, that I could do anything I set my mind to. My mother says the word onions differently. I pronounce it onions, she says onions. My siblings and I would tease her about it growing up, but I soon realized I wouldn't want her to call it anything else. One day, she called out the name of the tear-inducing vegetable the way we say it, and to my surprise, I hated it. It felt as though something had shifted in my life. Among a million other things, the way my mom pronounces onions sets her apart. Eventually, she reverted back to her usual way of speaking, and I was grateful, not only to hear the funny little word again, but because it taught me a vital lesson. The little things that make you up are the most important. The way my mom says onion is a representation of her, a melting pot of cultures and new languages, sewing ball gowns in the seventh grade, and crying out, Zuzanko ne! as I lift yet another poisonous mushroom to my lips. Take a hold of your metaphorical onion. Whatever strange things make you up, whatever weird habits, obsessions, or personality traits can be your onion. Embrace, embrace and emphasize the person you are because you deserve it. Find the, thing, find the things that fill you up like stardust and the side effects of your human experience. During my senior soccer season, the only thing I wanted was to score a goal, just the one that was all I needed. It was cool and all until I went, until I went on the field as a striker, a role for people who score. And yet, game after game, practice after practice, I couldn't do it. Several times the ball escaped the posts by such tiny margins, I was sure I'd offended some deity and this was my punishment. While the rest of my friends were captains and starters, I sat on the bench. My job became to roll injured teammates out, scrub the blood out of jerseys, and having everything in my bag, except for band-aids. Conveniently, I've never had band-aids in my bag. <laughs> um, in my heart, I knew I still brought value to the team, but it was a difficult sentiment to remember when it spanned across all three sports I played. I just wanted to be the athlete I saw myself as. Compared to these titans of things that I wanted, remembering my value seemed like a soft whisper in raging wind. The lack of success in my athletic endeavors meant I needed to change my perspective. Soccer's purpose in my life was not to shine on the field, but to learn to glow from within. Basketball's purpose was not to drain three-pointers every game, but to expand my mind as to what I thought I could do. Track's purpose was not to get on the podium, but to push myself further than I thought possible. Mazer sports are not my onions, but the team mom reputation I've got going for me is. The fact, that I need to translate, the fact that I need to translate my thoughts from Czech is one of my onions. My borderline con concerning need to have my calendar perfectly mapped out, my little bag with ladybugs on it, and my obsession with the live action Cinderella are all onions. Take a hold of your onions. Find them, cherish them, keep them close. It takes tears, time, and discomfort, but it is worth it. You, as you, enrich the lives of countless others. Do not allow someone to take the onion away from you for their small pleasures. Onions, though seemingly insignificant, are the crucial elements in any good soups, marinades, and your high school career. Though some may discount it as the vegetable that Shrek made famous or the stupid food that makes you cry, your onions make you who you are. Thank you. Good job, Susie. The next speech is by Rachel Gunderson. <laughs> to my dearest problems. Hurling toward an aspen tree at 55 miles an hour on skis was not my intended way of spending a Saturday morning. I picked a fight and lost with a glorified stick in the ground less than three inches in diameter. This useless, this useless twig gave me the chance to spend weeks in an all-inclusive resort known as the intensive care unit. Surgery after surgery, months in physical therapy, and a sweet disability parking pass. 
Sometimes I find myself traipsing through an ocean of personal tragedy. As I sulked in my hospital bed, unable to move, I had every excuse to be bitter, angry, and all around unpleasant. I grew hateful towards anybody who can walk and jealous of people who could eat something other than cold chicken broth and room temperature jello. I write love letters to my problems. Why love letters? Because brooding over broken bones never magically fixed them, and complaining about my sorry, sorry excuse for a meal never changed my dietary restrictions. They go a little something like this. To the Deer Valley Aspen tree 50 yards north of the Mountaineer Bridge. I don't like you. I never have and I never will. Don't worry though, I won't come and chop you down. You still have a long life to live. Thanks for the memories and the hospital bills. With love, Rachel. I've learned my letters don't have to be long, just sincere. That's easier said than done when a certain class shattered my perfect 4.0 GPA, but it's really all about perspective. Dear Mr. Watabe, <laughs> I am really good at math, <laughs> but I suck at calculus. Thank you for your patience and the curve. Yours truly, Rachel. I get in my own way, a lot. More often than I'm comfortable with admitting, school was pushed to the bottom of my laundry list of to-dos. Practicing, work, my rigorous napping schedule, and poor planning would leave me scrambling at the last minute, desperately needing more hours in the day. To past Rachel, every single Socratic discussion you showed up unprepared for never ended well. Stop telling yourself you're gonna wake up early in the morning and finish your reading. I can promise you, you won't. <laughs> Love, present, older, wiser, self-reflecting Rachel. Write love letters to everything that has gone wrong, everything that could have gone better, and anything that's out of your control entirely. Life isn't about the things that happens to you, it's about your response to the situation. To my dearest freshman research paper, I have never forgiven you for not auto-saving, but I still got you in on time. Dear computer number 21, every time you crash, it gives me a chance to remember the times when you were working properly. To the Mazer practice room, Talia and Timson and I do not need therapy. We just need to sit and cry on your floor every once in a while. <laughs> Dear Mazer Soccer Field, I never scored a goal, but my jersey means more than my stats. Dear Stuco Closet, no matter how many times I organize you, you just seem to get messier. Thanks for being the designated room of requirement. <laughs> and to my senior year, everything that was going right went left, and everything that was going up went sideways, and now that it's over, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. There will come a time in life when more things are going wrong than are going right. Fight the urge to write hate mail. Find joy within the chaos and laughter within the tears. I choose to fondly reminisce over my not so awesome Socratic discussions and the time I puked at sophomore prom. I look back and laugh at the time I sat down for an orchestra concert with absolutely no music on my stand because my stand partner, I, stand partner and I were just really bad at remembering that sort of thing. Regardless of where you are, how you got there, and where you're going, there will always be something to be mad about. There will always be something to hate, and there will always be a reason to scream, why me? Don't. It will only get you somewhere close to rock bottom. Instead, try writing your problems a letter. Better yet, a love letter. Find their amiable qualities and charming quirks because one day you'll realize how important they were. Eventually you'll see that your biggest problems are the source behind your best qualities, your strength, your will and your resilience are all reasons to write your trees, figurative and literal, a love letter. And to my dearest problems, I just wanted to say thank you. Thanks, Rachel. OK, the next uh, essay will be read by Lori Beltran. sitting down, facing the teacher and listening to the teacher. 
Sometimes we all talk, or I guess we all talk, but do we all listen to each other? The feeling of being alone in a full room is not a new experience. It is my turn to have the attention. This is rare. Avoiding it yet wanting the attention just doesn't make sense, but yet it still comes. Speaking with the vibrations coming through my mask to my classmates, to my classmates is terrifying. The worry of being judged is real every day. Although my voice is small, I am still big. I am here. Sometimes we misunderstand and we are, and we think we are not heard in class. The feeling of not existing in your own world. Yet there was always someone listening. They can be just like you too. Not having the same attention doesn't mean you are less valued, valued by. The loud and the bold, the bold seem to be more listened to, but our values are all the same. There is no value or a person that is worth more or less. All we have is ourselves. Waiting for outside acceptance is not nothing compared to accepting ourselves. Being heard is less appreciated than it should be, especially for the talkers they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have been able to be considered as a doctor if it wasn't for the rest of us listening to them. Why do we listen and care more about the bolder ones than the more quiet ones? We are all in the same room five days a week observing each other and learning new things, whether it be from what we like and to other little ideas. We can also tell and examine each other by the reactions we have in our everyday lives in class. Encouraging the quiet can really help them out and be more comfortable with the rest of the class or group. Giving them a chance can really help them and you learn about more and about each other and making new relationships on the way. Listen to the people you don't listen to. The quiet can have a big impact on your life or even the world. How should we know if Einstein was quiet when we, when we pay attention to him now when he is big? He might, have been, he might have been another quiet kid in class. You may miss their great ideas and thoughts. Giving them a chance is always a great way to take because, wait, sorry. Giving them a chance is always a great way to take because even if it doesn't make a difference in your life, it may make a difference in theirs, even if you see it or not. We don't have an excuse to not look for or try to bring them to us or make them feel imparted with us. When we try, it happens. They just need a little boost to get to the level you are. You should always be heard. We are all here at the exact moment for a reason. We all exist, we are all here. Good job, Lori. Okay, the next essay was written and will be read by Joshua Beckham. My name's Joshua Beckham. The title is, Don't Try Anything New, Ever. Don't try anything new, ever. Don't you dare subject yourself to something that could possibly be dangerous. What if you don't like it? What if you wished you hadn't? Hey, you do what you do, and they do what they do, and everything is fine. You don't need to seek something else out because you are fine doing what you have been doing. If you were to try uh, running cross country, you would find that you'd rather die than finish all the grueling practices that Coach Kemper has for you. You might see multiple people throwing up on Hill Day as you think to yourself, why on earth did I ever do this? The whole time you're going to get Preston yelling at you saying, yes you can, <laughs> when you very well know that you cannot. So don't ever do cross country, because crossing that finish line with the sweat running down your entire body as you collapse to the floor with an ounce of strength left in you 
to look up at the time and realize that you just set a new personal record will never be worth it. If you did track, you would inevitably get horribly sunburned and have to excuse yourself from geography class just to peel off a large amount of skin just underneath your collarbone. You would inevitably have to run 12 400 meter dashes at 100% when in reality you only think you can do about four before your legs and lungs give out. And you're probably right. With all these downsides, how could it ever be worth your while to have the best time of your life on a bus ride to the middle of nowhere just to compete with your friends, making the best memories of your life as you run as fast as you can? From Cody. Because you just slapped his bare leg really hard, and it is definitely going to leave a mark. Even if you do the first two, don't do Shakespeare. You will find anger, pain, sadness, frustration, anxiety, and much more all directed at yourself. You will probably break down and cry multiple times, and inevitably fall behind in calculus homework and Socratic reading. All that pain and suffering can never be worth the moment when your name is announced as a first place winner or when you leave it all on the stage for the final performance and you couldn't be more proud of yourself and your teammates. Show choir would be a waste of your time. You aren't good at singing, and you feel meh about the whole thing. You could be doing better things with your time besides embarrassing yourself in front of the class trying to sing all the high notes in Come Thou Fount. It just won't be worth it even if you perform at the Food and Care Coalition for the elderly singing Christmas songs and the look on their face makes your entire week. Don't do ultimate frisbee. You're busy with other things and it sounds a little lame anyway. Who even does ultimate frisbee? The team is probably no good and you have heard that the practices are really hard. You can't throw a frisbee at all and you have no idea what the rules are and it probably won't be fun. If you're thinking about doing ultimate frisbee, don't. That one moment when you tell your coach he is never getting that disc around you, and then you block it, and then you rub it in his face for the rest of practice, isn't worth the horrible leg cramps you are gonna get after every game. If you are thinking about trying something new, don't. It may change you forever, in ways that you didn't expect, and in the end, you could find yourself singing Billy Joel wearing tie-dye t-shirts. You could find yourself in a hotel sharing a bed with Adam Cottle as you find out he likes to cuddle in his sleep. <laughs> you could find yourself turning beet red in the face after Gracie Gigi decides to kiss you on the cheek in the middle of the scene without telling you. You will find yourself having more fun, making more memories, and laughing so hard that you are a little too close to losing consciousness. So don't try anything new. Don't do it. Because if you choose to, you will inevitably fall in love with it. Thank you. Great job. Okay. Okay, our final essay was written and will be read by Marie Hua. Yeah, my name is Marie Hua, and this is I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Massachusetts is a bookish place. I grew up there with trees and college towns and coffee shops and some lovely, ingenious, cynical people. In 13 years, I became well acquainted with them, as well as public libraries at every town green. Summer air so thick it could get your socks wet. Farm to table marijuana cookbooks crumbling Hampton factories from the 18th century, and folks who said the Pledge of Allegiance to Tom Brady. It was paradise. <laughs> In other words, Milton would have seen it coming. It took seven days for one family, one moving truck, and five chickens to make their exodus across the country, and in that time, my world was recreated. Instead of a marsh, the new house had a mountain behind it. Instead of corner-side coffee places, there were places that sold soda cocktails and bad puns. And instead of acres of woods and an old stone grotto, the new school had a church building in its backyard. I quickly determined two things. First, I was a stranger in a strange land. Second, 
that it would be in my best interest to, much like Odysseus, be a nobody, to enter out with four Cyclopic a AP courses, leave with a diploma, then go on with the rest of my life. Now that the school year is over, as far as being a nobody goes, I failed miserably, but through no fault of my own. As far as, go as, far as the diploma goes, let's just say it might be a close call. But <laughs> somewhat to the surprise of my past self, failure and a diploma are not all that I will walk away with. No, I will also have a handful of memories and observations. These include minor observations. The uniforms aren't all that bad. Cross country running in high altitudes takes your breath away. If you miss even one day of school, things fall apart. Ms. is not her real name. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the basic structures of life, Mrs. Slade will teach you about living, about being married on Valentine's Day, about heart-wrenching loss, about being the designated driver, and about airborne guinea pigs on the freeway. <laughs> Math is not simple, but Mr. Otave will try to convince you it is. And it is genuinely difficult to tell who is more of a celebrity, Kim Kardashian, Uncle Iroh, or Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Next observation. It is impossible to be a nobody amazer, mostly because it's too small. There is no hiding place for the new Red Cross type girl when your Latin class is a total of five people. But it's also because people take the effort to notice you. Mazer values connections so much that teachers will literally line you up and tell you to stare into your classmates' eyes so you can understand the importance of good eye contact. Additionally, Mazer students chose to come here. What this means is they show up every day intentionally, no matter how tired, stressed, or behind on Socratic reading they are. They are the types of people who do things just because they can. There's an essay cafe coming up? Okay, everyone bring cake. The weather's nice? Okay, let's have class outside. It is pointless to be a nobody because coming to Mazer makes you somebody. And of course, Mazer is a bookish place. In about four years, give or take, you'll become well acquainted with the likes of Richard Parker, Atticus, the pig Napoleon, and Piggy, the English schoolboy, Hamlet, Achilles, Brutus and Cassius, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, a guy named Guy, Capulets, Montagues, Jodes, Mrs. Rochester and Darcy, Hester Prynne, Huck Finn, Jim, Eliza, and Gatsby. And unlike some of the other faces you see every day at Mazer, these will be able to stay with you for the rest of your life. So it really doesn't matter if you come for seven years or 10 months. Mazer changes you like any good story. It makes you somebody and it gives you somewhere to turn. You're struggling with the paper on Greco-Roman philosophy? Mr. Simmons and his pseudo library of resource files is there. You need an informed opinion on the latest American politics? Shoot Dr. Barlow an email. Through the people you meet and the literature you read, Mazer makes its way into your habits, your mentalities, and your aspirations. When you're there, it is like a city of refuge. And when you leave, when you leave, it is a reminder to make life meaningful. Um, they're gonna be tallying the votes, I think, right now. But um, while they do that, could I have, uh, Cam Babcock is gonna, has a little something to say. So I don't have a last lecture to give, but I do have a thank you for a special teacher, and I will be waiting until she comes. So <laughs> it'll be just a minute while they wait to tell you. <laughs> what? Okay, yeah. When she walks in, can everyone ha um, can everyone start clapping for her? It'll. <laughs> I love you too, Michael. Uh, what, the senior class of 2021? <laughs> you're welcome, you're welcome. I know it's a great joke. <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> I've already read a 10 page paper, don't get me started.
Miss Gilders, can I have you come up here? Okay, for those of you that don't know Ms. Goodrich, um, she is retiring this year. Even though the seniors are already saying goodbye, we wanted to say goodbye and thank you. Here are these flowers for you. Um, yeah, I have compiled a list of tributes, kind words, and direct quotes from seniors. Um, we've had so many submissions that I won't be able to say all of them, but I will be able to say a few of them. Um, to start off with Logan Dunyon, uh, he said, I loved the first time I met her when she would say, any little rabbit's late today. It wasn't just how she said it. It was that she genuinely cared where the students were as if they were all her own children. From May, uh, her, her always saying, Wapa Wapa has got to be my favorite thing ever. She taught with love and support and it's truly where my love for learning blossomed. She, generally set, um, she definitely set the stage right for all the teachers I would have after her. For Maddie, one of my favorite memories from class with Ms. Goodrich comes from when my eighth grade class was reading Animal Farm. Ms. Goodrich gave us the opportunity to st um, simulate running for, uh, for a dictator by using whatever tactics we wanted in order to win, which I thought was hilarious. I loved how entertaining and thoughtful her lessons were, and I really appreciated the way she let us learn about the books we read. Smiley face. <laughs> Christian Keller. Miss Goodrich is the kindest teacher that I've ever had. I didn't understand that power could be found within the pages of books. I read until I had her class, uh, I read until I had her class in eighth grade. She has done so much for this school and nothing we can say can do it justice. Thank you, Miss Goodrich. From Kylie Chase, she has always had the most tender heart. A couple times she got emotional because she just wanted to teach us the best way she could. Just by talking to her or hearing about her, you can tell that she generally, um, she has such a pure and angelic heart. From McKenna, I TA'd for Miss Goodrich the term before COVID hit in 2020. My favorite part of my day was to go to fourth period English and to talk to her about her, how her day was. She's the sweetest, most angelic person I know. And for me, I specifically remember one day in eighth grade English class, you told us we were going to be working on grammar. We all groaned. You said, oh, it'll be fun. And I immediately responded with, we have two very different ideas of fun. <laughs> Amazingly, I was still one of your favorite students after saying that. <laughs> but seriously, thank you so much for the love and support you show your students. Without your eighth grade English class, I might not be here at Mazer today. You've impacted Mazer in the lives of all of us immensely and positively. We love and appreciate all of your incredible hard work, support, kindness, and love that you've shown each and every one of your students. We wanted to thank you for everything you've done for us in Mazer. We hope you have a great retirement. Love the senior class of 2021. <laughs> And here is the entire letter with all the words. she will remember each of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodrich, for everything. I want you to know that I've been crying for about two weeks. Every time I go through my files and say what I have to leave behind, then I cry a little more, and then I cry a little more, and then I cry a little more. You did a great job on your speeches today. Thank you so much for your hard work. I love you all. Thank you, guys. Okay, everyone, we have our winners. Um, in third place, 
um, is Tanner Heaton. In second place, we have Joshua Beckham. There you go. Okay, and for the first place, we have Rachel Gunderson. Yeah. <laughs> I present your winners. 